Just a few days ago, Tesla began opening its supercharging network to non-Tesla electric vehicles owners. As an electric vehicle enthusiast, I borrowed a Polestar 2 from a friend to try charging it at a Tesla supercharger. I must say, while I was able to start a charging session, a few things didn't go as planned. Let's discuss this bold move by Tesla and what happened during my charging experience. Stay tuned! As a Model Y owner, I am more than happy with the Tesla supercharging experience. The network coverage is good and uptime and plug and charge experiences are seamless. Unfortunately, these conveniences are not fully available to non-Tesla EV owners. For example, in California, 28% of public chargers are out of service at any given time, while Tesla chargers have an availability rate of over 99%. It's no surprise that there is so much excitement among non-Tesla drivers with this new change. To find the nearest supercharger, drivers need to use the Tesla app. After clicking on the Charge Your Non-Tesla icon, a map with superchargers retrofitted with an additional CCS adapter is displayed. I live in the Bay Area and the nearest location for me was in Scotts Valley on the way to Santa Cruz, which was a bit surprising. I expected Tesla to retrofit charges in many more Silicon Valley locations first, but it is what it is. On a rainy day, it took me over 40 minutes to get there. Fortunately, a few charging stalls were available when we arrived. But before I share what happens next, can I please ask you to subscribe and hit the like button if you're enjoying this episode so far? Thanks, I appreciate that. The charging port on the Polestar 2 is in the same location as on Tesla EVs, making life easier for Polestar drivers. I backed up to a post and unlocked the adapter by using the app. The Tesla plug was released with a CCS adapter on it. I plugged it in and it started charging. The charging speed was really good at first. The Polestar 2 can accept up to 150 kilowatts, and in combination with the Tesla supercharger, this capability was almost maxed out at 141 kilowatts. As usual, the charging speed started decreasing to 120 plus kilowatts, which was still pretty decent and expected. However, when the battery reached 50%, the charging speed quickly dropped to 6 kW and in a couple of minutes the Polestar 2 stopped charging altogether. I tried to relaunch the charging session, I unplugged the connector and plugged it in again, but the Tesla app displayed a message that the connection to the charger was lost. Bad luck! So I tried another dispenser right next to it. I went through the same process and was stuck on the same screen for a while, which told me that after plugging in, it might take up to two minutes to start charging. I waited longer than that, but I couldn't see any electrons flowing into my battery. This is where I gave up and left the supercharger with a half empty battery. Upon seeing the message on my screen that the connection to the charger was lost, I began to speculate on what might have caused the issue. While it's possible that the problem was on Tesla's end, I can't completely rule out the idea that my Polestar may have stopped accepting the charge due to charge management processes that protect the battery. Another possibility could be the rainy weather, which often causes issues in California. In fact, my family experienced that two-day power outages last week and the 5G network was also down. So perhaps this time the cellular network was also affected. Regardless of the cost, the end result was inconvenient as I had to adjust my Saturday plans to accommodate my limited driving range. It was the first time in two years that I left a Tesla supercharger with the battery half empty. Interestingly, I wasn't the only non-Tesla driver trying to charge that rainy morning. The owner of a Lucid Air had to occupy two parking spots due to the length of the charging cable, but thankfully there was ample space available. Going forward, Tesla should consider repositioning charging dispensers and potentially replacing cables to make charging for non-Tesla EVs more convenient. A couple of other things come to my mind when I think of this strategic move by Tesla. 
By opening up its charging network to other brands, Tesla could potentially access government funding, further improving its economics. However, for drivers to access the network, they'll still need to download the app, which may not be ideal for government support. The market seems to be trending towards the possibility of using chargers in the same way IC vehicles use fuel pumps with large screens and credit card payments. In California, charge point operators must undergo a CTEP certification by the Department of Food and Agriculture's Division of Measurement Standards to accept payments. Tesla didn't need that certification before, as it was a closed network for Tesla drivers only. But now it's changing, and I'm personally curious to see how Tesla is going to tackle this certification without a screen on the charger. So far, the main differentiators for Tesla's supercharging network have been ease of use and uptime. However, now that it's accommodating multiple brands, making fast charging work seamlessly may not be as straightforward as it was in a closed ecosystem. Tesla will need to work on interoperability and testing across various EV platforms to ensure it can continue delivering high-quality services to its natural customer base and new network members. While I encountered issues during my experience, I hope it's just a minor setback that will be resolved soon. At 52 cents per kilowatt hour, the price of charging may seem high, but I would gladly pay it if I were confident it would work for me. Overall, it's an exciting time for the EV market and I look forward to seeing how Tesla is going to address these challenges. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time.